Hi guys, in this video I will reveal a working hypothesis of gout. This is important because it gives us a working model of gout that we can use to come up with actionable steps to put our gout in remission. And we start right now. If you follow me, then you know that I'm a gout sufferer and I also reverse diabetes on the ketogenic diet. I've been studying the issue of gout for a long time and today's video presentation has come from literal months and months of work. So stay with me until the end. It will be worth it. First, there are three things that you need in order to have a gout flare. Number one, you have to have circulating uric acid. It doesn't necessarily have to be high circulating uric acid but you need the presence of it. Secondly, you need an inflammatory cascade. We need an environment, a systemic environment that is inflamed. And the third thing is we need the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. And more than likely, there are other factors involved. Remember that gout is a metabolic disease. It's also an inflammatory disease, but it is usually associated with type 2 diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and the other conditions that are shown in the slide. The whole point of this slide, the fact that you see a list of conditions here, on, on a naive level would lead you to believe that these are all different kinds of diseases that have their own independent reasons for existing. The truth of the matter is, is that a more likely explanation for these conditions and the fact that they happen together, most of them, is that they have some kind of central driving force, which is the same for all of them. The gout hypothesis naturally falls from what is called the excessive fructose and uric acid hypothesis of type 2 diabetes and obesity first proposed by Richard Johnson in 2009. Later, Dr. Robert Lustig expanded the fructose model to include the parallel metabolism of alcohol relative to fructose. The, both molecules, fructose and alcohol, when they're broken down, have the commonality that they produce uric acid. Additionally, the combined metabolism of ethanol and fructose drives systemic inflammation, dyslipidemia, endothelial dysfunction, and may well be at the heart of diabetes and metabolic syndrome. In order for me to lay down the gout hypothesis, it's important for you to understand some definitions. So I've been talking about fructose. It composes at least 50% of table sugar, and it actually makes up more than 50% of high fructose corn syrup. And we find sugar and we find high fructose corn syrups in most of the foods that Americans are eating. Secondly, what is this concept of excessive calories? I mean, it sounds like we're gonna sit down and force feed sugar uh, into someone, and this is not the case. I'm defining excess calories as the amount of glucose, fructose, and ethanol ingested in a meal that all arrive at the liver and the kidney at the same time. So it's the amount and type of calories and the time frame in which they arrive at the liver and the kidney that defines excessive. So in this slide, I'm laying out what might be considered a typical standard American meal. So uh, two people get together and they go to a pizzeria and each of them orders a couple of beers, or instead of the beer, maybe they order a couple of Coca-Colas. Then we have a large sausage pizza. Then we're gonna have some breadsticks, and we're also going to include a loaded salad. So the whole point of that last slide is for you, the viewer, to realize that we're gonna have about 625 calories of, and we're gonna focus in here on the carbohydrates that are going to arrive at the liver and the kidneys. About 20% of the glucose is gonna land at the liver. The rest of the glucose is gonna be distributed around the body. Some of it is gonna land at the kidneys. Um, other amounts of it are gonna go, for example, to the muscle tissue. The predominant amount of 
fr fructose, anywhere from 60 to 70 percent of it is going to land in the liver, all right, and the rest of it is going to land in the kidneys. This is an important point because the kidneys are in fact responsible for metabolizing some of the fructose. And the reason that this is important, again, we need to think back to what, what the requirement for a gout flare is. We need uric acid. So as we go through the biochemistry of this, it's important to realize that we're going to have uric acid being formed not only in the liver, but also in the kidneys. Oh, and I almost forgot, 80% of the ethanol is going to be metabolized by the liver. So we have quite a large load of calories. 20% of the glucose, most of the fructose, and the majority of the alcohol landing on the liver. Remember this concept, excessive calories. So what we're going to do now is take an individual look at each of the three macronutrients. We're going to look at what happens to the glucose, we're going to look at what happens to the fructose, and we're going to look and see what happens to the alcohol. In terms of our hypothesis, we are only concerned with the molecules that generate uric acid. Therefore, I'm going to start talking about the glucose, but I'm just going to summarize what happens to it, and then we're going to set it aside, because glucose itself, as it's metabolized, does not form uric acid. Remember, we have excessive calories of all three macronutrients, so we have excess glucose that's entering into the liver. When it enters into the liver, it's going to be shunted into a process called glycolysis, which through several steps is going to produce a molecule of pyruvate. The pyruvate is going to be transferred into the mitochondria, where it will be converted to, to a molecule of what's called acetyl-CoA, and then it's going to be pumped through the Krebs cycle. There are two things that you need to understand about the process of glycolysis. Number one, the pathway is going to be completely full because we're dealing with an excess of glucose. The second thing is the glucose in the blood is going, to, is going to cause high chronic expression of insulin, which has its own problems related to the, diabe to the diabetes, to the obesity, and to the cardiovascular disease. 80% of the ethanol is going to enter the liver in an unregulated fashion, and it will be broken down in two steps from ethanol to acetate. Those reactions are shown on the right side of the slide. You'll notice in the conversion of ethanol to acetate that we produce two molecules of NADH. You can think of the NADH being like cellular dollars. The NADH is then used to reduce the excess pyruvate into lactate. And lactate is an organic acid that when transferred into the blood supply is then excreted into the, into the urine by the kidneys. But lactate, being an organic acid, blocks the excretion of uric acid. And so this is the first place now in our discussion where we're talking about a process that causes the elevation of uric acid in our blood. And it's causing this elevation because the uric acid can't get out. So I want to call your attention to the right side of the slide once again. We have two steps there, ethanol going to acetate. Now we want to focus in on the acetate and see what's going to happen with that. In this slide, you can see that the acetate is converted to acetyl-CoA in, in a series of two steps by converting ATP into AMP. And then we have AMP deaminase through a series of steps that produces uric acid. So the metabolism of alcohol contributes to high levels of uric acid two ways. One way is we block the excretion because the lactate has to go from the kidneys into the urine. That blocks the excretion of the uric acid, so the uric acid rises. The second way is during the breakdown of the ethanol to the acetate, and then the acetate to acetyl-CoA, we actually produce uric acid. Now let's turn to the issue of the fructose. So we have the majority of fructose showing up at the liver. The other major fraction is now showing up at the kidneys. 
all of the fructose is going to enter the liver that arrives there and all of the fructose that arrives at the kidney is going to enter the kidney where in both cases the fructose is going to be converted to fructose 1-phosphate by a chemical reaction with ATP that first forms ADP where the ADP is then broken down into AMP and then AMP deaminase is involved in the conversion of the AMP into, you guessed it, uric acid. So let's summarize what we know at this point. We know that the metabolism of ethanol and the metabolism of fructose lead to the production of uric acid. An additional piece of information is to summarize what the animal studies and the human studies that have been done say about the uric acid. And the uric acid, it turns out, might be the central factor in driving dyslipidemia, metabolic syndrome, the reduction of nitric oxide, which leads to high blood pressure and endothelial dysfunction, which is connected to cardiovascular disease and insulin resistance, which by the way, is tied to the high levels of glucose and the, therefore the high level of insulin expression that's going on in the background at the same time we're metabolizing the ethanol and the fructose. Let's review where we are with the gout hypothesis. Number one, we've explained how uric acid is produced in the human. So there is a way for uric acid to get into the circulation, make, it, make its way to the joints where it can be crystallized. Number two, we've established that the ingestion of uh, sugar, high fructose corn syrup, ethanol, or sugary drinks can produce an inflammatory environment. And remember what I said about the inflammatory cascade. It induces the transcription of junk one. And we are about now to focus on that. The third part of, I, of our hypothesis was the activation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. So how do we get from step one and two to step number three? And now I'm going to draw your attention to junk one. Junk one is a transcription factor that is expressed during the metabolism of alcohol and fructose. And in this slide, you can see a recent publication that clearly connects the expression of junk one with the initiation of the NLRP3 inflammasome. So now in our gout hypothesis, we have all three of those criteria connected together. We have the formation of the uric acid, we have the initiation of the inflammatory cascade, and we have a connection between the inflammatory cascade and the initiation of the inflammasome that is a requirement to have the gout flare. One problem with our hypothesis is the location of junk one, where it's being expressed, right? So I just explained, and there's good data that shows that junk one during the ethanol and during the fructose metabolism is gonna be expressed in both the liver and the kidney. But how do we get from there to the joint? So in the cartilage, we have functioning cells which are called chondrocytes. The function of chondrocytes is to feed the surrounding non-living tissue, right? The, the, the cartilage itself and the factors that are in there that allow our joints to work. Remember that we have high concentrations of glucose and fructose in our system. So firstly, the fructose that enters the chondrocyte can be metabolized as I've already explained for the liver and for the kidney. But we have another factor here, because remember in the background, we have high glucose and under conditions of high glucose, the glucose that is in the chondrocyte can also be converted to fructose endogenously because of what's called the polyol pathway, which I'm now showing uh, in this slide. So you guessed it, we can form uric acid actually in the chondrocyte. And therefore, in the joint, we're going to have uric acid arriving there two different ways. Uric acid from the circulation and potentially uric acid from the production of uric acid in the chondrocyte. And what else happens in the chondrocyte? 
we're going to potentially have the expression of junk one in that location. So we don't have to invoke junk one arriving in the cartilage from either the liver or the kidney. It can be produced endogenously in the joint. So now we have all three things happening in the joint in our gout hypothesis. We have uric acid, the presence of uric acid. We have the inflammatory cascade. And we have the initiation of the NLRP3 inflammasome right on site. BAMO, gout flare. Now, before I propose a working model on how to put our gout in remission, I need to address the fact of protein. Because I know some of you, as you've watched this, are probably screaming out to me right now, Dr. Pete, what about the protein? Now, I'm not naive. I know that when you break down protein, when we digest it, we are going to end up producing purines because the protein is coming down with, in a cellular makeup. And when we get the purines, those purines are going to be broken down into uric acid. And this is clear cut. The thing that you need to remember about this is that the amount of protein that's being ingested in the standard American diet is about the same amount of protein that's being being ingested in the ketogenic lifestyle, which I have been in now for three years. And over the last three years, I've tracked my uric acid substantially. And I know that when I eat protein, that you see the uric acid rise, and then you see it fall normally over the course of the day, you know, post-meal. My main point is, is, is that the amount of uric acid that's being produced by the protein is not anything like what you see happen when you have alcohol, nor is it anything like what happens when high fructose corn syrup is ingested. So I've left, I've left the question of protein in the background here because I believe in our hypothesis that the contribution of the protein that it makes to the amount of uric acid is insubstantial uh, compared to the effect of high sugar drinks, alcohol, processed food, and high fructose corn syrup uh, in the products and, and things that we eat. The final question is, can we put gout in remission? And honestly, I am a walking, talking individual that has put his gout in remission on a ketogenic diet. So given our hypothesis, what are the things that we need to do? Number one, stop drinking alcohol. This is a major contribution to uric acid and the cascade to a gout flare. Two, stop the sugary foods, high fructose corn syrups, the sugary drinks, and processed food because processed food is loaded usually with sugar and or high fructose corn syrup. Consider the low carb ketogenic lifestyle because one of the key features of this lifestyle is we eliminate the sugar and all the things that I just mentioned. Monitor your daily uric acid using finger sticking and a handheld meter. And lastly, once you have the data concerning your daily uric acid, if it's still running at high levels, which is possible for, for those of us with hyperuricemia, then consider a, a uric acid lowering drug like allopurinol. In summary, I believe that I have laid the framework for a working model of gout. And with that comes the possibility that gout sufferers can put their gout in remission. If you've enjoyed this presentation and you're new to our channel, please hit the subscription button and also click the bell next to it. And with that, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next time.